So I'm in Horse Cave with David Foster. Phone's ringing. You're yep. an important man. It's busy around here. But, it's probably the president, but he can wait. Well, he can wait. Yeah. 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 He's got other things going on yeah. too. So. Right. Anyways, and you are the executive director of the American Cave Conservation Association. I am. Amongst other hats that you wear. I've been here about 38 years. 38. Came here from southwest Virginia where I, I started out as a cave explorer. Got a degree in geology and a degree in music and... Uh, um, just uh, was looking for something to do in my life that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, Bill Austin, who was the owner of this cave, uh, it, it was kind of a well-known figure in caving, and he was he didn't have any heirs that uh, wanted to run the cave, and so uh, he was looking for an organization, and I had started working for a group called the American Cave Conservation. We helped, I helped found it. I'd been a volunteer for it for many years, and uh, we were in Virginia, and Bill had offered uh, the cave here in Horse Cave of, to several groups, and they weren't interested, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why the cave was full of sewage. I mean, who wouldn't want a cave yeah, full of sewage? Yeah, who wouldn't want and that? Yeah. He offered it to us, and we said, it, it, it sounds wonderful. Yeah. So we came out to Horse Cave and uh, began working on the project here. And so I guess I became a bit of a cave historian in that process because we one of the first things we had to do was we built a museum mm -hmm. um, to kind of tell the story of the caves in this area. And yeah. that got me immediately immersed into the cave wars. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about some... And as you, we've talked about, you know, we've chatted a bit, is that, uh, you know, you can't really extract the history of Hidden River Cave from the cave wars and vice versa. They're right there neck and neck with each other. Uh, cave so, wars go, go way back to the uh, beginnings of this, of this state. You know, we have uh, some very large caves, some of the longest caves in, in the entire world here. And... Uh, you know, Mammoth Cave was one of the first uh, international tourist attractions in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mammoth Cave and Niagara Falls were sort of two of the big attractions, and you could get there by a there was a guy named uh, John Crowen who had uh, developed a stagecoach route out to Mammoth Cave. Okay, and you could get there by the river, and uh, he helped develop that. Before, before Mammoth Cave was a tourist attraction, though, in 1812, it was a saltpeter mine. So you had these uh, industrialists up in Ohio mm -hmm. uh, that had come down and invested in this, these caves to mine saltpeter. And after the War of 1812, they found new ways to manufacture the saltpeter, so they didn't need to get it out of there. Saltpeter was one of the ingredients in gunpowder. Right, and that was a big so, part of the revolution and 1812, yeah, it right? Us, it said, helped us keep yeah. from, we, we might be, we might be British citizens now if we didn't have saltpeter in the caves. Right, yeah. And we wouldn't a lot have worse food. Gunpowder. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd be speaking with a different accent. A different probably, accent, yeah. Instead so. of my hillbilly accent. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so after the, the war was over and the saltpeter mead d diminished, uh, they turned Mammoth Cave into a tourist attraction. Okay. And that would have been fine. It was a big cave. Uh, but the, the history of caves in this area can really be kind of tied to uh, the development of transportation mm -hmm. through Kentucky. And Kentucky is a kind of a, a unique crossroads right. in, uh, in the country in that we're we're not really east, we're not really south, we're not really north, and we're not really west. We're just Kentucky. We're kind of in the middle. You, know, yeah. you think of the west as the other side of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You think of the east as the Appalachian Mountain regions and the coast. You think of the north as the Great Lake regions and the south, you know, Alabama and Mississippi and all those states. And so we're kind of in the middle. And... Uh, what kind of happened was that uh, one of the first things to get shut up. <laughs> we got a 
I should take the phone out of here. Uh, that's all right. But, uh, it's just part of recording live on location. There we go. Yeah. yeah. But as Kentucky developed as a state, and more and more people came here, you know, there was a lot of cross-references. It happened in music. It happened in lots of different things. You know, we had a civil war here. Mm-hmm. Uh, right here in Hart County, Kentucky, where we're located, we had two generals, General Wood and General Buckner. Right. One fought for the South, one fought for the North. They were childhood friends. And uh, so there was divisiveness that was built into the community right off the bat. And uh, as the, the uh, right before the Civil War, around 1859, uh, the L&N Railroad put a line between Louisville and Nashville. That's what L&N stands for, right. the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And they ran a railroad line right through here. And one of the stops was a junction that's in the town of Park City now. It's called Glasgow Junction. Okay. Well, the railroads ran a spur off of that to Mammoth Cave because the railroads were very interested in developing tourist attractions because they wanted to sell a passenger ticket. They wanted to get you to come to, yeah. They were also instrumental in getting... Uh, national parks develop in areas because the railroads were there first and they could buy land and that was going to appreciate in value as the parks were developed. And so the l and put this spur to Mammoth Cave and then along that spur they discovered several new caves. They discovered a cave called Diamond Caverns, mm-hmm. um, Dossie Dome's Cave, which became a Hundred Dome Cave. Um, there was a cave called Proctor Cave. Uh, later on, a cave called Long's Cave. There was a, a cave called Colossal Caverns that the railroads were trying to develop. And this was all before the automobile was invented. So the railroads were really big into the cave entrance down here. You had these... Yeah. And sort know, of had a monopoly on where people could go, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And so in, in that time period, you you got to realize 19... Uh, late 1870s up through the 1940s, you had multiple depressions, you had world wars going on. It was a tough time. Mm-hmm. You had big players like the railroads and the national parks. You had farmers that had lived on the land for generations that were trying to somehow scrape a living out. You had northern industrialists and Yankees coming down and nesting. And uh, so What kind of fueled the cave wars was the conflicts from all these different Different. entities that didn't always work together and didn't always like each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Thomas, who was the owner of um, Hidden River Cave, Dr. G.A. Thomas, George Thomas, had the same name as the Civil War general. Right. And uh, but he was from upstate New York, and uh, his son H.B. Harry. Uh, they came down here and they developed uh, Hidden River Cave around the 1860s. Mm-hmm. Um, and they so have the house. They they built the house right. Yeah, they built the, uh, My the old Victorian it. house yeah. right next to the right above the cave. Right. And they had turned it into uh, it was a water source for the town mm-hmm. and a tourist attraction. Okay. And so all this was going on. We had the railroads developing these caves. We had man. The Mammoth Cave Estate, which was the old historic tour, you had guys like George Morrison that came along, who was a, a surveyor, who snuck into Mammoth Cave surreptitiously, yeah, and explored parts of the cave that were off the Mammoth Cave Estate's property, and then he discovered that, you know, since it went off the property, he bought the land over parts of the cave and opened a new entrance and called it the new entrance to Mammoth Cave which the Mammoth Cave Estates promptly sued him. Right. And he proved in court that it was the same cave, so he, he was a success in the cave wars. Gotcha. And that's still part of Mammoth Cave, the, the national park today, right? The right. new entrance? Yeah, the park, okay. the park eventually bought up a lot of these smaller yeah. caves. That I know I'm jumping. There. I just... Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Dr. Thomas came into this thing in the mid-1800s. You know, uh, Mammoth Cave was, you know, first discovered probably, I don't know the exact dates and nobody really knows, mm-hmm. 
probably 1790, something like that. And then um, when Dr. Thomas came along, there was a new invention, the automobile. Right. And so for the first time, people could tour the country on their own without having to get on a train. Right. And so Dr. Thomas invested in Hidden River Cave, mm -hmm. which is right downtown in the town of Horse Cave. It was a small town of a few hundred people that had developed here because it was a source of drinking water. And they discovered a, a small cave on the hillside outside of town that he named Mammoth Onyx Cave. Um, bought that, and it was on the old l and Turnpike, which is one of the first roads that went from Louisville to Nashville. And then in 1925, um, there was a major... Uh, international news story around a cave called Sand Cave, right? Where this fellow named Floyd Collins got trapped in the cave and became a viral news story. Then that was because you were saying earlier that it wasn't just the newspapers covering it, but that was kind of an early part of. That was Floyd was one of the first victims of the cave wars. He, yeah. he his family was a hard scrabble family that owned a farm on the north side of what is now uh, Mammoth Cave National Park, mm -hmm. but by the river. Pretty crappy land. It wasn't great for growing crops, really rocky. And, uh, but he found a cave. Okay. And Floyd loved exploring caves. He would disappear for eight, ten hours in the cave by himself. Don't recommend doing that. Right. And so he opened up this cave that he found called Crystal Cave. He spent years hauling wheelbarrows of dirt out and opening the trails and, and developing it. But Floyd had a problem because to, for the tourists to get to Crystal Cave, they'd have to pass all the Thomas family caves and Horse Cave. They'd have to pass the new entrance to Mammoth. They'd have to pass the Mammoth Cave Estates, the mm -hmm. old historic entrance to Mammoth. And then go down a long, wind, long dirt road to get to Crystal Cave. And by that point, all the tourists' pockets had already been picked. Right. And so he, was the end of the he line. wasn't making a lot of money. He was at the end of the line. But Floyd knew how extensive these caves were because mm -hmm. he was actively exploring them. And so Floyd found a hole out near the main road before you got to the new entrance to Mammoth and the Mammoth Cave Estates. And he thought it had potential, and he began exploring in it. And he crawled in this tight crevice, wedged a rock loose on his leg, and got stuck. Mm. And he was by himself, so it took a while for his brothers to find him. And eventually, you know, they heard about it, and pretty soon everybody in town was down there trying to figure out how to rescue Floyd. It became like this huge news story. Um, it went out on the radio, and you, you got to remember, before the 1925, radio was pretty much limited to like concert halls and places like New York City. Mm -hmm. But suddenly they developed remote radio broadcasting capabilities, so you could be at a cave in Kentucky broadcasting. Telling the world telling about. Telling the world. And this became one of the first viral news stories that... Every night, people would sit by their radio for two, for almost two weeks, listening to the Floyd, the plight of this poor guy that was trapped in a cave. What well, I mean, a horrifying thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, tragedy sells newspapers; it sells news. And so here's a guy stuck in a cave, and so it became a carnival atmosphere. People were coming from miles around to gather around the cave, and. They kept trying to rescue Floyd. They tried to pull him out. They couldn't get him out. They started work on a rescue scaff. Um, Henry Carmichael, who uh, had a mining company, was excavating a rescue shaft. Uh, nobody could quite figure out how to get Floyd out. Charles Lindbergh flew in rescue supplies. Oh, wow. And the, um, I didn't know he came, too. And of course, you know, when you got the press, you've got all this wonderful speculation going on. There are all these side stories going on, like there was a dog wandering around the cave entrance that the newspapers decided was Floyd's dog waiting patiently for him at Floyd. the cave entrance. And 
They found a girl that sort of knew Floyd slightly, and she became his love interest, and they were writing about that. And they, they had to find something to write about, because just writing about a guy stuck in a crevice, yeah. how much more do you say? Right, he's so still there. So they came there. up with all these human interest stories, and, these. and then the rumor got out that uh, Floyd was sneaking out the back of the cave and having dinner, and then coming back in the cave in the morning and pretending to be stuck for as a publicity stunt. And they literally had a court proceeding going on trying to prove that the rescue was real at the same time that they were trying to rescue Floyd Collins. It's, it's bewildering, but it's also just so indicative of how cutthroat it was at the time, Oh, it, you know, between it, it, it these different cave was. owners trying to find a way to get an advantage. So Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, the end result is they couldn't get Floyd out, and it's a very sad story. You know, he died in the cave, and mm. he was trapped in the crevice, and uh, his some of his brothers went on the vaudeville circuit, and they were raising money uh, to dig Floyd out and put him in a proper burial, and they uh, so they did that. Um, they got him in a burial, and then Dr. Thomas, the guy that owned Hidden River Cave, mm -hmm. uh, and his grandson always told me he did this to honor Floyd because famous European explorers were always buried in the caves that they explored. But they, he negotiated, Dr. Thomas negotiated with Floyd's dad to buy the body. Yeah. And, and he bought Crystal Cave. And he put the body in a glass-covered coffin. And the tourists were beating a pass to Floyd Collins' Crystal Cave to see the famous Floyd Collins. To come see Floyd Collins in the... So somebody we don't know who apparently got jealous and uh, maybe one of the rival cave operators and stole the body. Yeah. And they found him down on the banks of the Green River, a little more, a bit more mangled. Mm -hmm. And so they put him back in the cave, but they got rid of the glass-covered coffin. They put a brass top over it. And Floyd stayed there for, I guess, another 40, 50 years. And I, when I f first came here, I remember taking a trip into Floyd Collins Crystal Cave, and cavers would lift the casket and pay homage to Floyd and say hello to him and say a little prayer for him and things. And uh, one of the businesses right next to me in town was Collins Hardware. Yeah. Owned by Floyd's great nephew, Donnie Collins. And Donnie and his wife, Carol, heard some cavers coming into the hardware store bragging about saying hi to Floyd, and they were just appalled because yeah. he's been dead for 50 years. Yeah, yeah. They're lifting up the casket and talking to him. And so they uh, petitioned Congress. I got Bill Natcher to uh, uh, tell the Park Service that they needed to bury Floyd. Yeah. And so they got, the park had already bought the cave, and they buried Floyd in the Mammoth Cave Cemetery, and uh, that should have been the end of it. And, I guess it is, but you never know because the, the one date that the Park Service chose to bury Floyd, the guy that's, uh, well, the, the one date that they, they picked to bury was Easter Sunday. That's so crazy you to know, me. You think about it. Floyd Collins died in the cave, was taken out to a seminary, was put back in the cave, was stolen, was put back in the cave, was dug back up by the Park Service and put in a... This is the only man that's been out of the grave more than Jesus. <laughs> and they buried him on Easter Sunday. They buried so, him on Easter Sunday. So my prediction is that Floyd will rise again. He will come back. He will rise uh, again. And uh, this is a very amazing story. Yeah. Uh, but the Thomas family was a big part of that. And, and uh, they were the ones that ran Hidden River Cave. And for a while there, they had a little show cave dynasty where they were running... Hidden River Cave, Mammothonics Cave, and Floyd Collins Crystal Cave. And you could buy one ticket in the old Central Cave office right over here on 31W and uh, go see all three caves. Oh, okay. And yeah. It was quite the dynasty. And the cave wars had been going on for a long time. You asked about the cappers. Right, yeah, the cappers. And, uh, a... you know, what cappers were, and uh, I'm not sure cappers wasn't an invented word later. Okay. Uh, they realistically were more like cave solicitors. Mm -hmm. And there were people that would be hired by... You, you had all these caves. At one point, there were something like 21 different caves that were trying to be commercialized. Because during the Depression, if you had a cave, it was like having a gold mine. If you could put up a sign, cave tours, and some 
Yankee tourists would come in and give you a buck to tour the cave, that was free money. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was a lot easier money than picking corn and tobacco. Right. And so uh, everybody that had a hole in the ground had a cave. And they'd dress up in official-looking military-type uniforms, or police-looking uniforms, and set up stands on the road and flag traffic down and say, oh, this cave's closed or this cave's underwater. You need to go see this cave. And uh, so it was a pretty uh, vicious competition. Yeah. They called it the Kentucky Cave Wars. Cave Wars. and Well, and uh, yeah, the, you've got the flyers downstairs of that they would hand out and say official notice that this place was right, yeah. condemned or whatever, you know, and to sell the tickets to. Yep. I remember meeting uh, Louis Nunn, the former governor of Kentucky. And yeah. He was the um, he had been a cave guide here, and he he told me about back in the day going up and uh, going to a gas station where one of his rivals was had their brochures out. And they walk in and say, "Well, uh, we've upgraded these brochures. Do you mind if we change them out?" And they say, "Sure." So they throw their competitors' brochures in the trash and put theirs put out. Put theirs out. <laughs> Things so like fun. that, you know, it was a, it was a pretty heavy, heady competition. And uh, Dr. Thomas got right in the middle of it. Now, you got to keep in mind that uh, he was from upstate New York. He had two daughters. They wore long pants and smoked cigarettes, which was pretty scandalous yeah. back then. You know, they were not like some of the local folks. You also had a county that was divided by the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Horse Cave had more union sentiments. It was the industrialist part of the county, and the northern part of the county had more southern sentiments. So there were already these divides that were there. And when Dr. Thomas kind of came into town, uh, he bought the caves. Um, half the people liked him, and half of the people didn't. Yeah. I still experience that today. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, he uh, had the caves, he had one of the more successful cave operations, but it was threatening. I think his biggest competitor was Mammoth Cave. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Thomas had a local rival named Clarence Owens. Now, Clarence ran the railroad hotel, which is a few blocks from the cave. You'd think that these two guys would have been working together right. to promote the cave. Yeah. But they were bitter rivals. Uh, the railroads actually owned part of the cave rights that Dr. Thomas had developed, but he'd been, he'd been running Hidden River Cave under the railroad property for so long that he felt like he had essentially squatter's rights to run the cave. He mm -hmm. had the cave entrance he developed. He'd spent hundreds of thousands of dollars back in the 1920s developing this cave tour, which was a small fortune back then. Yeah. And uh, Clarence Owens and Dr. Thomas didn't get along very well. They had a knife fight out on the street. That's um, incredible. Dr. Thomas was walking down the street and Clarence stuck a knife in his side and they got into a fight and apparently Dr. Thomas beat him up. And the story goes, and it may be apocryphal, I don't know, um, I heard some of the local wags told me this when I first came here. They said that uh, Clarence went up to Louisville to recuperate from his wounds and he sued Dr. Thomas for assault. And Dr. Thomas hired a private investigator and found out that Clarence Owens was recuperating in a house of ill repute, oh. not, a, not a hospital. <laughs> not at a hospital. And but, so uh, the suit got dropped. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of love between these guys. And when Clarence Owens found out that the, the property that we're sitting in right now, the mm -hmm. cave museum building, uh, before it was a cave museum, it was apartments and downtown buildings. But uh, before that, it wasn't, there wasn't anything here. There was just a big uh, entrance to a cave. And Clarence Owens found out that this property was available, so he bought it before Dr. Thomas could buy it, built the buildings to hide the cave. Yeah. So we call this our spite building. The spite we building. Built out of spite. It, well, I mean, it does block it from that one side. It you does. wouldn't see it as you're approaching, that's for sure. Yeah. 
And then in 1939, Clarence Owens built a gas station mm -hmm. over top of the cave passage. Yeah. And he put in a restroom. And a, he drilled a hole from his restroom into the cave. And so as a tour would be going through Hidden River Cave, they'd flush the toilets on them. Imagine. Is this, yeah, we think politics is dirty today. Yeah, that's a... You know, we're a bunch of pikers compared to those folks. <laughs> yeah. Imagine and, the spike, though, to drill all the way down, because that's a good way through, right? I mean, it's about 150 feet down. Yeah, that's not a small task to draw, drill a hole that deep. Yep. Just to make sure your rival knows what you think of them. Yep. Well, well Dr. Thomas, uh, he promptly sued Clarence Owens for groundwater pollution. Yeah. And I think he did eventually prevail on the groundwater lawsuit. But Clarence and the railroads countersued for trespass mm. because their property was going underneath yeah. that gas station property. And they eventually prevailed in the Frankfurt courts where the judges were all owned by the politicians down there. And so uh, Dr. Thomas lost the biggest parts of the cave. He lost Sunset Dome, the biggest room, lost most of the cave to that lawsuit after yeah. he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing it. So that was a... A huge, huge blow yeah. to the family, and uh, and it's and when I came here, you know, of course, I heard these stories, and I never understood why these people weren't working together, mm -hmm. why the railroads even had a dog in that fight. Why did they care? Yeah, they just needed the surface property. Why did they want to close down the cave? And then I began examining the. Uh, I had. Well, I had a copy of the court records that, the, uh, that Bill Austin had given me from his family's records. So I'm reading through these court cases. And I began to piece together what actually happened. Uh, apparently, uh, the railroads had a real estate guy named George Zubrov who came down and would like talk to Dr. Thomas and ply him with bourbon and try to get him a little loose on the bourbon and uh, he got Dr. Thomas to make a joking offer of, Dr. Thomas would always claim, I don't need to sell you, I don't need to buy the cave from you, it's my cave. It's his cave, right. But he got Dr. Thomas to make a joking offer, well, I'll give you $100 for the cave. And they used that in the court case to defeat the adverse possession claim. Mm. And uh, so they basically said, Dr. Thomas knew it wasn't his cave. That's why he offered him a hundred bucks. And so he lost the cave. He lost the cave. He lost the cave. But why did George Zubrov, who worked for the roads, want the cave so bad? Well, he didn't want the cave. He was the secretary and treasurer of a land development organization called the Mammoth Cave National Park Association. Okay which was formed to try to create a national park around Mammoth Cave. See, after the Floyd Collins incident, this area was world famous. Right. And so there began to be a movement to turn Mammoth Cave into a national park. And you know, I'm not going to argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing because you know, parks are like mom and apple pie and baseball. and They're important. But the people that were doing the land speculation were not was not the National Park Service. This was an organization that was trying to force people off land that they'd been on for generations at depression level prices. Right. They were trying to take the the property and through eminent domain and, and force them to sell. And they went to uh, people like Dr. Thomas, and he wasn't going to sell. And so the way to get Hidden River Cave to stop being a competitor for Mammoth Cave was to get it to close. Get it, yeah. And so they they filed the trespass mm -hmm. against that to, to close that cave. And it worked. Yeah. You know? So the biggest, Dr. Thomas was the biggest competitor for Mammoth Cave, and he lost his biggest cave uh, during that time frame. And... Um, so he He's basically doing, just had the entrance and a little bit of walk-in area, and that right. was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then around the same time in 1941, and I don't know if these characters were connected at all, but the uh, the Hart County Creamery came in, 
And uh, when you go into Hidden River Cave, you go down a long flight of steps. Mm -hmm. And the biggest part of the cave is to the right. And it goes for four or five miles. And then to the left, it goes for four or five miles. But the main tourist part was to the right. Okay. That was the part that got cut off by the trespass. Okay. And then the upstream passage, they were still doing tours up there. But the creamery came in about a mile upstream and drilled a hole. And they were making cheese. And the byproduct of that was a really milky substance called whey. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't have a sewer in town. So the whey would just go into a sinkhole. And it turned the underground river the color of milk. No. Now, if you've ever smelled a milk jug yeah. that got left in the refrigerator too long and went sour, mm -hmm. that's what Hidden River Cave smelled like. We had a river of milk, sour milk, flowing through it. So suddenly, this happened in the night, around 1941, 42, 43. Um, the cave, half the cave was polluted. The other half was closed or trespassed. And the family just kind of threw up their hands and said, well, we're done. Yeah. And so they still ran Mammoth Onyx Cave. They still had Floyd Collins Crystal Cave, but Hidden River Cave was toast at that point. Uh, and then in the 1960s, um, the Park Service began working to acquire a Floyd Collins Crystal Cave, and they were able to buy that. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, there were all kinds of dirty tricks being played there. Uh, the park people didn't like Dr. Thomas very much. I... Uh, I met a, a park ranger uh, that from the old days that actually lived in my hometown in Galax, Virginia. Yeah. Two houses down from my mom, and my mom was all excited when I moved out here. She said, oh, this new neighbor lived out there. And so I went and talked to him, and he didn't know that my ties to Hidden River Cave or to Bill Austin. And so he just starts telling me all about the devil, Doc Thomas, and how they, they laughed and laughed out at Mammoth Cave National Park about dumping the sewage into Hidden River yeah. Cave and things. So there was just a lot of animosity there against the Thomases and against the uh, the cave because it wasn't Mammoth Cave. Yeah. You know. And so it took us 75 years to get the cave back and right that wrong. Uh, we had to go back to the railroad and acquire all the properties and and get a new tour developed. But it was... When I first came here, we didn't know if we were ever going to get the cave back. Yeah. We, we thought we could maybe build an educational center, mm -hmm. some kind of a museum. Um, well, and even at that time, you said the, the, what you had of the cave was so polluted anyways, right? That you couldn't really get in yeah, there. Yeah, the only thing living in the streams was sewage worms and sewage bacteria. And they, they made a half-hearted effort in the 1960s to build a sewer plant. Mm -hmm. And it was a biological treatment system that used algae growing on limestone rocks to break down the sewage. Yeah. Well, you overload that system with creamery waste. Right. And then you put heavy metals with poisonous metals like chromium and lead and cadmium yeah. that killed the algae. So what was going into the ground from the sewer treatment plant, which was right upstream from Hidden River Cave, was just pure unadulterated sewage. So worse than so it took before. what was a bad problem and made it worse. You know, we mm. collected all the sewage from the region, put it upstream from the cave, and so that's what we came to when Bill Austin contacted us. We were in Richmond, Virginia, and he said, "I want an organization to come and help me clean up the cave." Um, and uh, he had approached several other groups, and they weren't interested. And we just thought it was a really cool project. We had this small fledgling nonprofit with a few hundred members, and we were wanting to do good things for caves. Yeah. And uh, oh my gosh, to be Bill offered us a place, an office, and a building here in mm -hmm. downtown Horse Cave, and you know you could literally smell the sewage in the building. <laughs> yeah. My next door neighbor had an insurance office, and he told me the story about one year the pollution was really bad and he called the EPA up and said you know we've got this cave sewage coming out that smells and can you do something about it and they said well we'll come down but we might have to fine you for operating an unsafe work environment oh my gosh for having a business on Main Street in Horse Cave yeah you know? and so this is what we walked into and immediately we got immersed into the 
of the sewer battles because Bill had enlisted a guy named Jim Quinlan, who was the hydrologist at Mammoth Cave, mm -hmm. to help figure out how to where the, all the water was going and do all the dye tracing and figure out the science behind where the caves were running. But Jim was being told by his park superintendent that you work for the park service, so you can't do anything off the park boundaries. Oh. Well, all the sewage was coming in off the park boundaries. Oh, okay. So Bill got the local banks uh, to raise some money, and they paid Quinlan on the side yeah. to uh, do some studies off the park. Yeah. And he'd do that on his own time. He'd come out. And they dye traced and mapped where the caves went and determined that all this sewage was going through Hidden River Cave, was coming out through the largest spring in the state of Kentucky into the Green River, then flowing downstream through Mammoth Cave National Park. So suddenly the sewage issue is not just affecting Hidden River Cave, it's affecting the park and everybody. And it's not just a local issue it's anymore. It's not just a local yeah. issue. So then they go to Bill Natcher, who is the like, third person on the House Appropriations Committee, so he's in a position to get money, and they, they talked him to, into putting a couple million dollars into the Park Service's budget to help build sewers. They went after Farmers Home Loan Administration loans uh, and raised uh, somewhere between 10 or 15 million, I think, it, over time to build a sewer system. And this turned out to be the first, the very first regional sewage system mm. in the United States that would connect multiple cities. Because we had sewage from Park City, Cave City, Horse Cave, and Mammoth Cave National Park that were all affecting the cave systems. Okay. So this new system put in two plants, one in Cave City and one in Horse Cave, and then tied them all together with pipelines from Park City and Mammoth Cave, and then took the affluent above ground out to the Green River to get them out of the cave systems. Because right. once you dump the sewage into the cave systems, there's no green plants, there's no sunlight, there's not enough appreciable water flow to break down the sewage any further, so the caves would just go anaerobic and just be dead systems. Yeah. And so when we finally got this system up and running, almost immediately in 1989, this is not ancient history. This is 1989. Yeah, I mean, this is in my yeah. lifetime. Um, the cave started smelling bad, but we had all these small cities that were competing. They'd get a piece of money for Park City or a piece of money for Cave City, and they all wanted to spend the money on their part of the sewer and not the entity. Oh. Well, you had to have a place for the sewage to go. Yeah, that's So you had to joke. start on one end and work backwards. Yeah. And so there were all these fights. And at one point, the city council and Horse Cave refused to meet because they didn't want to pass the sewer bill. And uh, we, we literally distributed flyers with the phone numbers of city council members telling people to call them and tell them to show up so we could have a sewer. Yeah. Because there were people in town that didn't want the sewer because they were going to have to pay sewer bills for the first time. And uh, so we got this, the sewer online in 1989. Almost immediately, the, the cave odor began to go away. Yeah. Finally got everything up and running. We, we still had problems periodically over the years, but mm -hmm. we've been able to get them, get them fixed and solved. And the, I think this is the, the best, the absolutely greatest environmental economic success story yeah. in the world. Yeah. Because you think of... When you think of environmental stories, you're not thinking of them as economic stories. Right. But yeah, most people actually think it's kind of the opposite. Well, right. we're doing this, so it's going to hurt. But what happened in Horse Cave was we built this regional sewage system to protect a cave. And I had people telling me, well, who cares about the cave? Let yeah. the cave be a sewer. Right. Who cares? Yeah. You know, we're going to have to pay higher sewer bills. And we're going to lose our factories. We had a creamery and a metal plating plant that employed maybe somewhere between 100 and 200 people, not even that many. Yeah. And we're going to lose these jobs because they're not going to be able to afford to pay the sewer bill because they're pretty poorly run factories anyway. Yeah. And so we were the evil people in town trying to kill all the jobs. We were the tree huggers, or I should say the cave hog huggers. Yeah. Hard to hug a cave, you know, there's not much. Yeah, there. yeah. But... Um, 
what really happened though is an amazing story because the EPA at the time had given Horse Cave the death penalty. They said you can't have any more factories because you're polluting the river, you're polluting the park, you're polluting everything downstream from you because you don't have any sewage treatment. Yeah. And so when we built this regional sewage treatment system, suddenly Horse Cave is open for business. Yeah. Dart Container Corporation came and they've expanded twice. Uh, T. Marzetti salad dressing is here. Um, Sister Schubert's rolls mm -hmm. came in. We have a, a metal plating plant that makes wheel covers for the chrome covers for the Corvettes that are all made in Bowling Green. All of a sudden, we have 3,000 factory jobs in a town of less than 3,000 people. Yeah, wow. And the cave doesn't smell anymore because we're treating the sewage adequately. Mm hmm we invest the money in doing things right, and now we have all these jobs. You got all the and we're jobs. like the envy of most small communities around here because yeah. of that. Yeah. So we have a huge tax base that's allowed us um, to help us develop the cave, to help us get a nice park in town, to help us do things, to build a fire hall, to do good stuff mm -hmm. in town because we've got a bigger tax base because of all those jobs. So it's all tied to getting the cave cleaned up. Yeah. And um, it's just been miraculous, you know. And for many years, we struggled as a tourist attraction because we were just a cave entrance. Yeah. And, yeah. And this is one of the most unlucky caves on the planet because we had the railroad lawsuit mm -hmm. in the 1930s, 1939, closed down part of the cave. We had sewage in the 1940s that closed down more of the cave. Sewer treatment plant built in the 60s that made the problem worse. And so here we are in 19 and seven, 19 and, uh, oh no, 2017. I'm in my wrong century. I've been here so long. <laughs> I don't know which century. We've been talking a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In 2017, we finally get somebody at CSX Railroad that will sell us the old L and N properties that had closed that part of the biggest part of the cave. Yeah, we acquired that, and we were able to go get some grant money. We went to the James Graham Brown Foundation, mm -hmm. largest foundation in the state, and they had given us money several times because uh, one of our um, Bill Austin had, had a cousin who was mentored by the head of that foundation, and he. They didn't do much down in this part of the country, but he talked them into taking a look at us. And they came down and they saw the polluted cave and they saw how hard we were working to try to fix it. And they gave us a $250,000 grant, but we didn't hardly have a nickel in the bank. Yeah. And uh, that's it, a leap of faith. It, it was a leap of faith. I can't, yeah. what great people they were to see the value in what we were doing when we didn't have any track record. And so we took their money and did good things with them. We built the museum. We kept buying properties. We acquired more of the cave. So then in 2017, we got the last big piece of the cave from the railroads. Uh, we had 100000 from the Brown Foundation to kick things off. We went to um, Appalachian Regional Commission, which is a federal mm -hmm. granting agency that gives money to Appalachian counties. And Hart County is right on the edge of Appalachia. And they gave us a $300,000 grant. And then I went to the Dark Container Corporation, one of the big factories upstream from us, and we'd had some problems with them, but they had a plant manager that had gotten his first job working for me as a cave guide. Yeah. So he was familiar with us, and we weren't threatening to them, and we'd never tried to shut any jobs down in town. And so he helped us get their foundation to get another 100000 And so we opened this tour. We spent four years developing a building the longest swinging bridge in a cave in the world, building this half a mile of tour back to Sunset Dome, which is one of the largest cave rooms in the United States. And so here we are in February of 2020. We finally got to Sunset Dome, and we're all excited to open You're this there. massive new cave attraction. And then this little thing called COVID hit yeah, and shut us down for three months. 
but it was the best thing that could have happened to us. Yeah. And I'm embarrassed to say that. So I know COVID was a horrible thing for a lot of people. But what COVID did was it freed up a lot of federal money and mm-hmm. state money to help individuals and businesses and nonprofits that were struggling with it. And so because we had been shut down for three months, we qualified for PPP loans that were forgiven. And the SBA, the Small Business Administration, for the first time ever, said, we're going to give loans to nonprofits without requiring collateral. Mm -hmm. And so we took out a $150,000 loan. And uh, so for the first time ever, we had cash flow. Yeah. We We had always lived hand to mouth. We started this as a small nonprofit with 200 people. We'd make just enough off the cave business to get through the summer and barely squeak through the winter. Yeah. And constantly fundraising, trying to stay afloat. Suddenly we had $150,000 in, in the bank and uh, we spent it all on advertising. We, mm-hmm. we, and it, because we developed a new attraction, we'd gotten the, the big dome open. And so in the minute the pandemic was over in 2021, people wanted to go places, they wanted to spend money. We opened up this new attraction. We, we built signs and, uh, to advertise it. And uh, we went in one year's time from averaging 11,000 customers a year yeah. to almost 30,000. Wow. it's uh, a big jump. What a success story. Yeah. You know? And uh, it, it was just amazing. Um, we haven't quite gotten back to the peak that we had in 2021 because that was just a crazy year. Everybody did well. Yeah, everybody year. was out. And... But we're still doing 25,000 visitors a year. Yeah. And we're two and a half times what we were doing before. And that's the difference between barely making it and being able to hire educators and mm-hmm. program staff and do good things for caves and protect endangered species sites and, and run a, an exciting program here. So yeah, it's been... a an well, interesting four years. Well, and you were telling me too that like your staff, it's uh, they're all cavers. They're all you've been able to hire people that this is their passion. Well, we didn't intentionally do that. I had yeah. I had staff for thirty years here running this cave, and almost rarely were they cavers. Yeah. For some reason, the whole bunch we got hired this year, they all like to cave. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And they'll they'll come in and they'll work an eight hour shift, and then they'll say. Um, they were going in the cave to do some exploring after hours. We'll be out about midnight. Yeah. We'll call you when we get out. And they'll and I'll just be like, well, try not to be late to work tomorrow. Yeah. And they'll go explore in the cave. And it's kind of neat because when a tourist comes uh, to a cave attraction, you know, do you want to take a tour from a some guide that's never really been in the cave? Yeah. Or do you want to take a tour from somebody that's actually involved in exploring un- unexplored parts of the cave? Yeah. That can tell you what caving is really like. And that's what we can do here. Yeah. Well, I think that's so, really neat because it's more than just like, well, here's a little bit of history that maybe, but it's, yeah, yeah. people who are living it and can We're talk in about. active exploration. We're doing it. Yeah. My guys are going in there. Uh, they're finding stuff. And to me, it's very cool. This is like the, this area is like the Mount Everest of caving. Yeah. You know, the tallest mountains have all been climbed, but the longest cave in the world is still not completely explored. We haven't reached the extents. Yeah, we haven't gotten And that. Hidden River Cave may one day connect with Mammoth Cave. They're yeah, right. you were saying the, the water connects somehow. Well, the water connects with what's called the Hicks system okay. downstream. And actually, when I went to DART and to get their donation to help us build the tour, mm-hmm. um, their manager also said to me, hey, we own a, a cave property down, uh, downstream uh, and, and we're interested in selling it. Would you, selling the property to the Amish, but would you like us to fence off the cave and give entrance and give it to you? And we said, yes. Yeah. And that turns out to be the Hicks system, which is a 20 mile long cave that comes out into the Green River where a lot of the water was flowing from mm-hmm. Hidden River. Now there's a five mile stretch in between Hidden River Cave and Hicks Cave that's unexplored, oh, okay. but we know the water goes there. The water goes there. So we're thinking eventually they connect and it becomes a 30, 40 mile long cave system. Now, meanwhile, across the interstate, there's a huge cave called Fisher Ridge Cave that's being explored that's 
like 170 miles long. Mm -hmm. It's only a few thousand feet away from connecting with mammoths. It's eventually mm -hmm. going to connect with mammoths. Right. And it's only a few miles away from Hidden River Cave. So if we ever get up underneath the ridge between us and uh, Fisher Ridge, there's the potential for another 50 to 100 miles of cave there. Yeah. And so we could eventually see this huge system that we're part of that could be over a thousand miles long. Now, I mean, it's speculation. It might never happen. Right. But the geology is possible. Yeah. And what we've seen in Mammoth Cave is that Mammoth Cave started with half a dozen different cave entrances that eventually all connected up. All became... Yeah, it wasn't a linear exploration yeah. that they walked through the, the yeah. beginning and walked whatever it is. How it's many miles is it now? 500? Huge or? Swiss cheese. There's over yeah. 500 miles yeah. in the whole system when you connect, add all the big caves around. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot of cave here. Yeah. And, uh, and part of our effort to protect Hidden River Cave is to convince the powers that be that Hidden River Cave is as important as Mammoth Cave. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of water flowing through it. The water flows into the Green River. Right. The Green River is a very significant river. There are many endangered species in the Green River. It flows through Mammoth Cave National Park. So we're like the canary in the mine. You know, the, you put the canary in the mine, if the air goes bad, the canary dies. Right. It's time to get out of the mine. Well, if the water in Hidden River Cave goes bad, well, that's the first step before it flows out to the Green River, yeah. and then through Mammoth Cave National Park. Yeah, because I've heard the Green River is one of the most biodiverse in the state. Oh, if there not are more in species of part. fish in the Green River than in all the Europe's of all, all the rivers of Europe. Really? Yes, it's a huge biodiverse. Yeah. Region. And so, you know, we're seeing this area develop very heavily and very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, Nashville is moving towards Bowling Green. Bowling Green's expanding north. Elizabethtown's expanding south. Glendale is one of the biggest developments in, in Kentucky history, the big uh, Ford Motor and uh, Blue Oval uh, yeah, right. electric battery plant. They're bringing in 5,000 people in a town of a few hundred. And that's just 30 miles north of us. Yeah. So we're going to see hundreds of new houses built here. We're going to see new factories. We're going to see the... And meanwhile, we've got this huge zone around Mammoth Cave National Park where... What goes into the ground goes into either Hidden River Cave or Mammoth Cave National mm -hmm. Park. So how do we protect those world-class resources? Yeah. You know, we're not about uh, closing down jobs. We're not the kind of organization that wants to lay in front of bulldozers. Right, right. But we want to convince the businesses and the people that live here that the caves are a very important economic resource and a world-class environmental resource, mm -hmm. and we need to protect them. Yeah. We need to do what we can. Well, it seems like you all have a track record, though. I mean, even with this big sewage project, you know, a number of years back that, sure, it was yeah. it, it was a little bit of uh, pain in the beginning of it, but yeah. now it seems like it's, it's born really positive for you. You know how to do it. You know, you have yeah. to build the sewage infrastructure. Yeah, so build it front. right. Yeah. You're not, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're not saying we don't want growth. We just want proper growth. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's been a, I've been here 38 years. It's been an interesting ride. You yeah. Know, I, I look at a lot of the people, the old guys at Mammoth Cave, many of them have retired or passed away. And I, I came here as a young guy and now I'm, all of a sudden I'm like one of the older institutional memories of the region. Yeah. And I'm trying to get a lot of those stories told and, and out there because as you know, as you've researched this, there's, there's been a lot of uh, stories told, and some of them are BS, and some of them are... Yeah, there's you know, a lot. And one of my uh, complaints about the people that tell the cave war stories is just that so many of them are people that are... They, they're cavers that live outside of this area, that came down from Ohio or other places, or they're park rangers that were here for a season or two, and they write a book about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I worked with Bill Austin for many years. He was my mentor. His grandparents were the Thomas family. Uh, they were right in the middle of 
And so we have a different perspective on the payrolls than, than people that are outsiders that come here yeah. and write about them. And there, there hasn't really been a cave war book written. Maybe I should write it if, with all my free time. Yeah, all um, your time that you from have. From the but... perspective of the insiders, because it's really, a, a, it's not just a story about caves. It's a story about social economic conditions yeah. and people that exploit them and how... Uh, the, the difference between the haves and the haves nots mm -hmm. and how you how things have evolved and, and developed and uh, and the politics plays a, a huge you know we're not getting into politics here right modern politics we're staying away from that right oh and, yeah that's a the whole different set but, of uh, but, but the but the whole cave war story is a political story it's yeah. a political story of you know who owned the cave entrances how much power they had how they developed, where they were located, and uh, and there were a few successes, and uh, and there were some horrible failures. You know, yeah. Floyd Collins lost his life fighting the cave wars. Oh, yeah, Hidden River Cave was polluted and closed for seventy five years because of the cave wars. Yeah, I my story is not over yet. I think of myself as one of the successful cave yeah. warriors, right? Uh, because I'm still here, mm -hmm. and we've turned this into something. Uh, George Morrison was a successful cave war, warrior, and uh, but uh, you know it's it's been a challenging thing, and I think I was telling you the story earlier about you know the mentality of the cave wars. It's not a good economic development mentality. It's an every man for himself, and it's right. It's the sense that there's only so many customers, and if you take some, you're taking mine. Right. Instead of looking at it like this region is blessed with a lot of great caves, let's build them all up. And instead of half a million visitors a year, let's get a million visitors a year or two yeah. million visitors a year. Um, it's the old crab in the basket syndrome where, mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of crabs are in a basket and one of them tries to better himself by climbing out of the basket. Instead of lifting them up, the others reach up and pull them pull down. Pull down, yeah. We got to start lifting each other up around here. Well, and that's one of the things. I mean, you know, I'm here working in a partnership with the Cave Land Marketing Association. Mm -hmm. I think it's so great uh, reading some of the history and uh, that some of the counties would be like, "Don't go to that county." Ages ago, mm -hmm. because oh, they've got bad caves. We got the good caves, or whatever, and that yeah. was part of it. And so now you've got all these people that are saying, you know what, let's all work together. Let's all put our heads together and figure out how we get to your point. Let's right. get more people to the region. And then we're not fighting over. We don't have to fight over who gets what there's enough to go around for everybody. Yeah. yeah. I think we're missing the boat marketing this area. I think we've done a horrible job of marketing it. And I think a lot of it is just that uh, for so many of the caves that were here for years, they just, located along the road to Mammoth Cave and they just assume that we'll we'll grab some of the tourists as they go out to the park. Yeah. But they haven't marketed the area. You know, I visited a cave in South Korea um, about 15 years ago on the East Sea, beautiful location in the mountains. They took up this, this gorgeous concrete pathway up into these mountains that looked like the Great Smokies. They were just gorgeous. Yeah. Right on the edge of the of the sea and we went in this cave and i had never heard of this cave before it's yeah. in a small town called sam Cho, south korea and we go in the cave entrance and the first thing we see there's some cultural exhibits of of aboriginal type cavers that were in their little hut around the cave entrance and stuff it was kind of neat and then we go deeper in the cave and there's a string quartet playing bach oh wow inside the cave yeah i don't know if this is a regular thing or if they did it for us visitors yeah um staying the still walkways all the thing it was like first class this cave did over a million visitors a year mm. wasn't even on my radar yeah mammoth cave gets frequently listed if you google one of the most famous caves in the world yeah mammoth cave is almost routinely at the top oh yeah, yeah. they do four or five hundred thousand visitors a year yeah there are probably a half a dozen caves in China that do more than a million years a week. Wow. A million visitors a year. Yeah. Here's one in South Korea I'd never heard of that does a million visitors a year. We're 
we need to be marketing to those folks right. in Asia. They like caves. Yeah. Americans are kind of like, oh, I'm kind of scared of them. But, uh, yeah. you know, I think we're missing the boat marketing this area. This should be an international yeah. area for the caves. Well, if you need be. somebody to go to Asia, you know, I'll go over there. <laughs> I don't know much about it, but I'd, I'd be interested to go, to go yeah. chat. and uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but... No. And, there, and, and the thing is, as I develop my organization, I'm interested in tourism because I want, this place funds my organization. Right. So the tourists help us uh, raise money to build bat gates to protect endangered spice, mm -hmm. species and things like that. But I'm interested in seeing the American Cave Conservation Association become a bigger organization right. that can go help caves in other places where there are sewage problems. Yes. Where there are endangered species problems well, yeah. because you've got a lot of cave rock we call it karst mm -hmm. in the tropics and third world countries and developing countries oh okay and yeah. these folks are going to make the same mistakes that we made yeah if somebody doesn't help them right so that would if i had a dream of what i could turn this into it would be for hidden river cave to continue to be a very successful uh tourist attraction that beat the cave wars mentality yeah, and that the American Cave Conservation Association could be the kind of organization that could be a worldwide organization. Yeah. Uh, that, that's my dream. Well, I think that's a noble goal and you all have the blueprint, it seems, for how to, one, looking ahead to see what Pratt Falls are there, but also if there's already issues, you guys have kind of navigated some of that to try to Try to figure out, all right, how do we make this better? And you can prove it worked. Well, you know, it's it's a difficult thing to do things that nobody's ever done before. Yeah. And uh, we've done several things like that here. Yeah. You, know, you don't have a blueprint. You don't have a, a map that shows you the way. Yeah. And uh, But it's an exciting thing to do that, mm -hmm. you know, to get into stuff that you, you don't really know where it's going to turn out. Yeah. But you know it can be done. And once, you, once you've done one or two impossible things, the concept of impossible becomes a little less impossible. I like that. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, thank you for your time today. I know we spent a lot of time today. <laughs> yeah, we have. <laughs>